All right, everybody. Um, did my screen shrink tick down? There it goes. Oops. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Houston Beekeeper Association meeting. Um, sorry we're on Zoom tonight, but uh, with uh, the Harris County uh, declaring a state of red danger for COVID, we thought they might close Bayland Community center and we'd be stranded without a place to meet and decided to be safer to just go ahead and meet via zoom this month and then go back to in-person meetings uh next month with just a little bit of luck so um we have uh, uh our mentor problems been kicked off we have a great speaker tonight and um let me just get through my little agenda here so membership um everybody needs to re-up their membership uh, it's $15 for a student, $25 for individuals, $40 for a family. So it goes, you know, for a calendar year. And uh, that gets you the SCEP, the mentor program, um, course of the community of beekeepers. And uh, and then also the SCEP will tell you all about different bee education opportunities around Texas. Um, and then you get to rent our equipment, which is basically free to rent. Just check it out and then uh, uh, access to our swarm list. So... Our mentor program. Um, let's see, Wendy, did you want to say anything about this or? Uh, I'm coordinate. I'm Wendy Hager. Hi, I'm coordinating the mentor program this year. And we still have a couple of people who would like to be mentored that um, we don't have a match for. And so uh, if, you know, this might involve going to visit them at their hive, or if they don't have a hive yet, maybe they come and visit yours. And uh, people are looking for different levels of mentorship. Some people are just getting started. Some people have been keeping bees for a few years and just would like to see, you know, tips mm -hmm. and tricks, what they might be able to improve. So uh, please uh, reach out to me. Uh, I need to remember what the email is i'll put it in i'll put the email in the chat oh there you go so in the chat is a link um if you want to sign up either as a mentor or a mentee and uh anyway um excited to keep that going all right awesome well thanks for doing that for us wendy okay let's see oh i gotta click back on this there we go there we go so our speaker tonight dr peter lau uh, he began researching pollinators over 10 years ago over native bee pollination efficiency on a watermelon agro ecosystem and salt preferences of honeybee water foragers. He received his BS in environmental systems, ecology, behavior, and evolution from UC San Diego and then received his PhD as a USDA NIFA predoctoral fellow at Texas A&M. Sorry, I had my speaker on. Under the direction of uh, Dr. Juliana Rangel. Um, he is currently a research ecologist for USDA's new pollinator health uh, in Southern Crop Ecosystems Research Unit in Stoneville, Mississippi. Dr. Lau's research has focused on various aspects of honeybee health with an emphasis on bee nutrition. In particular, he studies honeybee foraging preferences and uses a geometric framework for nutrition uh, to better understand bee nutritional ecology. He incorporates aspects of palynology landscape ecology, plant biology, and insect physiology to better understand the nutritional basis for honeybee foraging preferences. And he's also researching ways nutrition can be applied to mitigate stressors bees experience. So Pierre, I'm gonna stop sharing and then you can start sharing and start your talk. Okay. There we go. Let me mute myself. All right, can everyone see and hear this okay? We're good to go. Okay, great. All right, well, first of all, thank you all for having me here today to present um, this presentation uh, once again. And thank you for the introduction. Um, I spent the past seven years in Texas and I just recently moved out last August to um, deeper into the South in uh, Mississippi. Um, but um, I'll be talking today about uh, most of my work that I did during my PhD and most of this is uh, still in the process of getting published. And I, I think that 
um, especially at this time of the year, as we're starting up the bee um, keeping season once again, um, there are some things that we can really think about from this talk and apply to um, beekeeping practices and, and also certainly things that we can look forward to uh, in, for improving our colonies. So for some of the newer beekeepers here, I just have a little bit of introduction, um, but this is an image depicting a lot of the different factors that affect honeybee health. Um, and, um, and this image was drawn up around the time when colony collapse disorder was peak, was at peak um, fear for um, the entire public. And this is frozen. There we go. Um, so here in this, um, we, we see a giant truck of pesticides rolling through um, in an agricultural setting. We have pests and parasites down here. We have landscape change, which I also attribute to um, nutrition because um, the changing landscape um, can definitely affect the resource availability and quality that pollinators have access to. And then we also see down here, we have poor nutrition where you have different types of pollen substitutes um, being um, fed to the colonies. And then you have a bunch of other wild theories here uh, as part of this joke. But um, this graph, this image is just a general schematic of the honeybee resource flow for the newer beekeepers. Um, so we have nectar, honeybees mainly collect three resources, nectar, pollen, and water. So nectar is a primary source of carbohydrates for bees. It's collected and distributed throughout and used throughout the entire colony. Um, water forages will collect water to mix with the brood food and also to cool the colony down on hot summer days. And then pollen is a part where I'll be talking about um, and focusing on today because that's the bulk of my PhD work at Texas A&M. And the reason why I became so interested in pollen nutrition is because um, this graph shows that it's still very poorly understood. So uh, if so, some of you may have heard of Dr. Jamie Ellis out in University of Florida, he was one of the ones who started the Master Beekeeper program, which um, continued to branch out to different parts of the country. But he runs the Bee Lab out at University of Florida, and they did this project and published this in 2019, where part of the project looked at the colony strength over time when bee colonies were fed different types of diets. Okay, so you have all these different types of brands of artificial pollen substitutes. You have your yellow line, which is natural wildflower, wildflower pollen, and this purple line is your negative control where they did not feed these colonies any types of pollen sub supplementation or sub substitutes. And it's very clear what we're seeing here. Um, bees that were fed wildflower pollen, natural pollen, outperformed all of the colonies that were fed other resources, including the negative control. And we see that the colonies given artificial diets didn't really perform any better than the bees that weren't giving anything. So as Jerry Wright said in her review paper, um, the nutritional basis of pollen supp supplements is poorly understood and a more rational approach based on honeybee ecology and physiology is needed. So pollen is the main source of protein and lipids for honeybees and it's something that's essential for bees in order to develop their um, mandibular gland or hyperpharyngeal glands for um, making the brood food for developing workers. And really at the end of the day, colony growth and survival uh, will depend on the income of pollen that they're able to collect and bring in because that's the main source of proteins and lipids and other nutrients. So when I first came to Texas A&M in you know, 2014, my first objective was to work with Dr. Von Bryant, um, who fortunately passed away a couple of years ago now, um, but um, he was a paleontologist who identified um, who, who, who use paleontology and identify pollen types in your honey to tell you what honeys um, your, your bees are collecting from, uh, what plants your bees are collecting their honeys from. But I worked with them to identify the main floral resources that provided urban and suburban honeybees and at a national scale um, over the course of an entire year. And this is a giant collaborative project with Michigan State, University of Florida, um, Bay of Crop Sciences, um, and RDO Consulting. And we collected our um, pollen samples from these several sites. We also have a publication coming up in the upcoming couple of months or so on, on the pesticide residues that were, were associated with those pollen samples as well too. 
but for the sake of this talk, I'm not really going to go into that in detail. But we, they sent me all the pollen samples from all over the country in these urban environments. And um, I, I used paleontological tools to um, process these pollen samples and analyze them. So this is a little work set up here where we process the pollen so that we can see the visible characteristics, morphological characteristics that we would use to identify the pollen grains to the lowest taxonomic um, level possible. So I mean, it's almost like playing CSI or forensics in a way where you're, um, you can trace back the pollen to the plant that the bees visited because each plant will produce a very unique pollen type that's specific to what the um, uh, species of the plant is. So here are a few images on what some of these pollen types can, may look like. Um, magnolia trees are all over um, the suburban urban area. So this larger pollen grain here is magnolia. Um, we have willow and the uh, smaller grain here is willow. This is crepe myrtle, which you, you see all over the summer, late spring and summertime. And this grain on the corner is sweet clover. There's a few more grains here. This is wild rose, here's oak pollen, here's lilac pollen, sumac pollen, your daisies and weeds pollen, and sweet gum pollen. Just to highlight some of the diversity and what they look like. So we mm -hmm. compiled an entire database that's published in plus one. So you can uh, look this paper up and find the journal. And this um, slide here is just showing the results from the California data, but we analyze them by season. This is summarized to the family level. If you look in a supplementary table in that paper, you can see the breakdown on even the proportions of the different types and the, um, of pollen down to the genus, sometimes even species that we detected in the sample at that given time of year in that region. Um, and for Texas, we analyzed it in Austin, and I know y'all are in Houston area, but if you have not heard of the B4 region, uh, regions page, um, uh, this is on the on, on NASA.gov page, so I can actually show you. I have this pulled up already. So if you go to this website, um, honeybee, look up um, NASA honeybee nets honeybee forage regions, and you should be able to pull up this website. And so a little bit old, but a lot of it's still very relevant and it's break, broken down by regions and it's interactive as well too. So Houston will be here. And when you click it, it has um, some of the main honeybee forage taxa um, for this region of Texas. So it has the family, the Latin name, common name, the plant type, even the month that it's usually um, in bloom and when it usually ends and whether or not it's a significant um, a resource for honeybees here. Another resource that is really neat that you can definitely check out and play around is called Beescape. So Beescape was developed by Pennsylvania State University in collaboration with the USDA and other institutions. And you can enter in an address. Uh, so in this case, I entered in um, the address where I think the Houston Area Beekeepers Association usually meets. And um, it will take you to this area and you can analyze um, the resources, uh, resource abundance at a three kilometer range or five kilometer range of the specific address um, in the different times of the year. And it also has data on the insecticide loads that your bees may be exposed to and even the availability of nesting sites for native or wild pollinators. So you can play around with this if you're looking for a place to um, put new colonies or an apiary on. Um, you can enter in the website and you can actually get some really cool and neat data and information on whether or not it's a um, good size resource wise and uh, low insecticide wise. So just to summarize some of that first part of that study, um, spring definitely had the highest um, pollen tax diversity at each region, which was very expected. And then uh, trees and shrubs are actually a very important pollen resource for bees in the late winter, early spring. So in about a month or so, you're going to see all these um, shrubs and rose trees that start blooming. And this is actually a really important resource for honeybee colonies when they're building up and ramping up their colonies for later on in the spring when there are a lot more of the um, herbs and herbaceous plants that are blooming. And then in the summertime, we actually found very low taxonomic diversity. Um, and we, we, we kind of, one idea for the a possible reason why is because there 
um, in, at least in Texas and even other regions, it gets so hot, um, especially mid-August, that nothing's really blooming out there. There's only, there are only a few resources available for bees to collect from, so that's what they may be limited to. So after my project, after I presented it a bunch of, to a bunch of beekeepers, well, a lot of questions I got was um, is whether or not there was a nutritional basis for pollen foraging. Um, do they have preferences for the types of pollen or plants that they are collecting out there? So in order to answer this question, we use the geometric framework for nutrition. And it, it sounds a lot more complicated than it really is, um, it's, but it's a state-based modeling approach to explore how animals solve the problem of balancing multiple and changing nutrients in a variable environment. So basically how this works is you have an, a graph where on the x-axis you have a nutrient, in this case, protein eaten, and on the y-axis you have amount of carbohydrates eaten. And this is an organism right here. And this is the nutrient space. So you have one diet here that's high protein and low carbohydrates, and another diet here that's high carbohydrates and low proteins. So there's no perfect diet available to this organism. Okay, in order to get optimal growth and reproduction, the organism has to reach this point, but it cannot do that if it only is limited to one of these diets. If it consumes just a high protein diet, it's only gonna go along this rail. So what this organism need, would need to do is consume both of these diets at different proportions until it can reach its optimal intake target for um, optimal fitness. And this tool um, has been used uh, many times um, because it can be used to determine how these different nutrients can affect the survival and physiology of different animals. For example, the New Zealand kakapo parrot. Um, this is a parrot that is endemic um, to New Zealand and was um, almost extinct at one point. And the, the conservatory out there was trying to rear these parrots back up um, and trying to get them to reproduce. And they're feeding them these parrots, a supplementary feed that they feed to common, commonly to general parrots. But these birds were not reproducing at all. And they brought in these scientists, um, Dr. David Robinheimer and Stephen Simpson too. And they um, helped figure out what the reason was using the geometric framework for nutrition. They looked at the natural diet of the parrot, which was a rimu berry and found that the amount of proteins and lipids in the supplementary diet was completely mismatched with what is in their natural diet, the rimu berry. And the, di the diets that were being fed to the parrots um, had significantly less calcium than what they would need. And calcium is a micronutrient that these birds would need to develop like the eggshells for reproduction. So um, once that was resolved and they made, made edits to the um, diets that they were feeding them and along with several other changes, these diets, as of 2019, they had one of the better breeding seasons on record. And these are actually um, known as one of the, um, uh, the world's fattest parrots as well. Okay, so with that being said, with that example, um, my, my whole idea, I'm bringing this graph back because we, we, we know that we have a very similar issue with honeybees where we're seeing these artificial diets that we're giving bees are not optimal compared to the natural diet. So my whole idea was to take that model and apply this um, to honeybees and see if we can do it, um, something similar with them. So the objective here now is to use a geometric framework to test the extent honeybees prioritize lipid and protein and lipid intake. And we focus on these two nutrients because these are two uh, macronutrients that honeybees primarily collect pollen for, uh, whereas nectar is um, what they, where they would get their main sources of carbohydrates. Okay, so we had to develop a diet where we can control the amount of proteins and lipids in there. So we had a source of protein, lipids, we added some carbohydrates, and we kept that standardized throughout all our diets. And a few other ingredients I'm not going to get into detail about. But we came up with different diets ranging in um, protein to lipid ratio. So that's the um, percent protein relative to the percent lipid. So those are your two numbers there. Okay, and then we did these cage experiments with one day old bees, so we know that um, we so that we can control their ages, um, the, or their um, so we can make sure that we are doing these experiments on nurse bees, which are the um, group that will primarily be eating proteinaceous foods. And we first did a no choice test with one of five diets or negative control, and we also measured um, certain aspects of um, bee physiology to look at how they perform. But I'm not going to talk about that in too much detail here. And when we subjected bees to um, one of these diets, 
um, on the x-axis, you have the different food treatment groups. And on the y-axis, you have the amount of food that they collected. We see that the B is given a 30 parts protein and 20 parts lipid diet, actually where it consumed the most diet compared to the other treatment groups. Now, just with this data itself, we cannot say that bees prefer 30-20 over all the other diets because we did not give them both of these diets to compare and test um, between one another and develop a preference. Um, all this is showing is that what, when bees are given 30-20, they're um, able to consume more of it than any other diets, okay? Um, the interesting thing is when we plot this on this geometric, um, framework plot that we saw earlier. So uh, once again, we have protein on the x-axis, but instead of carbohydrates, we have lipids on the y-axis. So remember, these are the nutrient rails. So if you were a B and you were given, put in the group, uh, in the 3515 group, you can only, no matter how much diet you consume, you're going to remain on the slope of this line. Okay, so you're going to move, you can move along this line, but you're never going to go around other parts of this um, space in the graph. Okay. So what's interesting here is that we see that the three intermediate diets here kind of line up once it hits this point right here, about 1.8 milligrams per B of lipid. So bees in these cages would consume diet up until they would hit this point. And that's kind of like the threshold, at least for the duration of the experiment. And that's where they would stop. So we kind of see that in these intermediate diets, there's some um, lipid regulation going on here. Okay, instead of um, protein, because it's just all over the place. And we, we have statistics that also support um, the, what we're seeing right here too, but I'm not going to get into that in detail. So now we want to look at how, whether or not there are preferences. So we had three different treatment groups and we did three uh, different choice tests. So in the first one, we had 30-20 compared to 20-30 and, and et cetera. Okay. So in this first group here, we paired 30-20 compared to 20 parts um, 30 um, protein and lipid. And what we saw was that bee, bees would actually prefer and consume significantly more of this 30-20 diet compared to the high lipid diet. When they were given 35-15 and 20-30, bees would significantly prefer the higher protein diet. But when we were given, when we gave them 35-15 compared to 25-25, there was actually no preference in how much they consumed. So they consumed them at, an, at a relatively equal amount. It was not statistically significant. Okay, so now I'm gonna move this graph over to this corner and assign each one with a symbol, okay? So that way we can kind of keep track. And I know this is a lot of information right here. So I'm gonna walk you through this um, and, and, and hopefully we can keep track of everything that's going on using these symbols. So once again, this is our same geometric framework um, by coordinate plot where we have protein and lipids, okay? So I'm gonna, let's start off with this triangle group, 35-15 and 25-25. Okay, so we, we're looking at this line here. So the bees were given this diet and this diet. Okay, the bees consumed both of these diet at a relatively equal proportion until it hit this point right here, okay? On the circle group where they were given 35-15, and 2030, right here, the two extremes, the high protein and high lipid diet, the bees consume significantly more of the 35 protein diet than the 2030. But once again, they also landed right along this point in the circle right here. So just wanna note this, it's on the same exact slope as the 3020. So neither of these groups were given 3020 diet, but they consumed them at di different proportions so that landed along this 30-20 line. So that's really, really cool. So in the perfect world, when the bees were given 30-20 diet, they shouldn't be touching the 20-30 diet at all, right? Um, but that was not necessarily the case. Um, so in the perfect world, it will also line up right along this line, but it's actually natural. And this is pretty common for bees to actually experience both diets when something is there and available. It, um, some bees would consume that. Um, but they will still proportionally consume the um, preferred diet significantly more compared to the, um, the uh, um, other diet that is not optimal. So because they consumed a little bit of this 20-30 diet, it shifted slightly over to the left to where it became a little bit more lipid biased. But the overall, when you average everything, the protein to lipid intake target ratio was about 1.4 to 1 protein to lipids. 
which is very close to 3020, which is um, 30, uh, 1.5 to one. So this is a number I want you to remember for um, later on in the presentation. Okay, now this graph, I'm bringing this back. This is that no choice test. Remember in that no choice test, when they're only given one diet, they consume, they're able to consume the most diet when they were given a 3020. And so basically what that means is, what that possibly means is when they're given the optimal diet, they don't have to regulate, they can just freely eat this um, diet without having to, without needing to over consume maybe protein or lipids and they reach an optimal point. So now we wanted to take this out to the field and um, see if our results that we see in the lab is reflected and we can recreate, replicate that out in the field with a full colony and also not, we use nucleus colonies in this case, so we had a little bit more control and with natural pollen. So we had two pollen types that we obtained. One was brassica and the other one was rose. And we fully analyzed the nutritional content of these two pollen types. And what we found was that the protein to lipid ratio of these two pollen types are actually very similar. So one was uh, about 1.2 to one and the other was 1.11. But the interesting thing is um, overall, brassica had a higher concentration of total proteins and lipids compared to rosa, where it only had 38% versus 53%. Okay, so we, we have several hypotheses here. Um, so either since the two have a very similar protein to lipid ratio, they can, the bee colonies can either collect an equal, relative with equal proportion of the two pollen types because it's a perfect ratio or it's a similar ratio, or two, the bees would collect more rose pollen compared to bees that are given brassica pollen because um, it's a lower overall concentration of nutrients. So they would have to compensate by collecting more of the rose pollen compared to brassica pollen. Okay, so we set up these experiments uh, in cage nucleus colonies we first did a no choice test, and then later on we did a choice test. So I'm gonna start off with the no choice assay where one group, group A was given only brassica and group B was given only rosa pollen. And what we see is the behavior of the bees is not, is telling us that these two pollen types are actually very different from one another. Okay, so in this, in these two graphs, we have the amount of visits at a particular Petri dish and then on these two graphs, we have the amount of pollen that the foragers collected and brought back to the colony. And in both cases, the honeybee foragers significantly preferred collecting brassica pollen over rosa pollen. Or not, I'm sorry, I should not have used preferred. Uh, they collected significantly more brassica compared to rosa pollen because in the, once again, in this case, they're only given one option. Okay, so this tells us that these two pollen types are not very similar from one another. Okay, and our, both of our hypotheses, hypotheses that we um, initially had um, were basically rejected. Okay, so we wanna look into this a little bit further and we decided to look at the fatty acid um, content in these pollen types. And when we plot the uh, by coordinate plot with, with what they collected um, on a protein to fatty acid on the y-axis, we actually see that there are actually, these two pollen types are very different from one another. Um, brassica actually has almost three times as much as many fatty acids compared to a rose of pollen. Okay, so now we decided to do a choice test, but we decided to do this a little bit differently where we manipulate the frequency of brassica to rose of pollen within a nutritional space or within the environment so that we can really tell whether or not they do have preferences. And so in A, in group A, these bees were given twice as many brassica compared to, twice as many rosa compared to brassica, but that did not matter. Okay, regardless of um, the frequency, bees would significantly collect more brassica compared to rosa in both of these two treatment groups. And they would visit and collect more of brassica compared to rosa. And when we plot this on a by coordinate plot with the two treatment groups, we see that these two points completely overlap with one another and they are um, regulating and prioritizing um, the poll uh, brassica pollen compared to rosa pollen. Okay, so we looked into this a little bit more further and we looked at the uh, fatty acid distributions between these two pollen types. And what we saw 
was that brassicapollen, not only did it have about three times as many fatty acids compared to rosapollen, but it's higher in palmitic acid, oleic acid, and linolenic acid, whereas rosapollen was significantly higher in linoleic acid. So if you're not familiar with these terms, linoleic acid is omega-6 fatty acids, and linolenic acid is omega-3 fatty acids. And um, we hear about these two fatty acids in human nutrition as well. Omega-3 fatty acids commonly found in uh, fish dietary supplements like salmon oil, fish oil, um, is also found in egg yolks as well. And it's known to improve cognitive performance and learning and memory in humans. And this is actually the same as um, honeybees as well too. There have been studies that have shown that bees that were subjected to eucalyptus pollen which are very high in omega-6 fatty acids compared to omega-3 fatty acids, actually showed impaired learning and memory. So this omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid balance is also very important for honeybees, and brassica actually has um, 55 times more um, of this uh, ratio. So just summarize some of these findings before I move on. Uh, so we see that nurse bees regulate the protein lipid intake, but they prioritize lipid regulation when in our no choice tests and then um, and in our cage experiments. And then in our field experiments, we see that the fatty acid profile, not the bulk lipid content, um, best explain the differences in behavior and foraging preferences for the different pollen types. And to think about and bring everything back to how this applies to the industry and how this might apply to you as a beekeeper, um, we see the mismatch uh, and the performance in uh, different colonies fed different pollens, pollen type or pollen types and substitutes. And we see that the you know, natural wildflower pollen outperforms everything else. Um, why might that be? So we saw that our ratio um, was approximately 1.4 um, protein to lipid ratio. That's what bees regulated in the cage experiment. But when we look at and, and that percentage, how that translates percentage wise is about 30% protein and 20% lipid. Um, and when we look at what's being, uh, what's available in industry, um, we, everything is being advertised as high protein diets, nutrition, a lot of the current um, nutritional practices for honeybees is to emphasize protein, high protein for growth and development, which makes sense um, because protein is what um, we need to develop tissues and build muscles, et cetera. Um, but at a certain point, too much protein can actually be fatal to um, animals. So there have been studies in ants and even honeybees. Um, uh, there's a, I, th I think the study was done in South Africa. I don't recall exactly off the top of my head, but there um, are examples in many different systems where overconsuming protein can actually be toxic to animals and actually induce higher mortality um, to them. And in, in our case here, in a lot of the protein substitutes that you can purchase in the, in, in the industry, um, everything's advertised as high protein. You see, you see protein values of up to maybe 50% protein and only 3.8% um, fat here. So we see a huge mismatch of the amount of protein lipids um, compared to what's available in um, the industry. So going beyond that, that's already, that's already something that we can definitely apply um, in practice, at, at least in terms of developing diets for the future. But we want to go beyond that. And we want to ask whether or not uh, nutrition can actually be applied to honeybees and improve their tolerance to um, stressors. Um, for example, um, pathogens such as deformed wing virus and nosema and maybe even pesticides too. Um, so, I mean, if for us as humans, if we are healthy individuals, chances are that um, we're, we're gonna have a higher immunity and tolerance to, um, from getting sick, right? So we, um, and there are a few examples of this in honeybees as well too. So these two studies looked at how diverse pollen diets can actually increase honeybee immunocompetence and susceptibility to um, diseases. In this case, they used Nosema as an example. And then, um, Pollen that's high in fatty acids can even play a role in inhibiting different bacterial pathogens in colonies. And in a different system, fire ants that were infected with viruses actually were able to alter their diets um, and adjust that based on, uh, in order to improve their tolerance when they were infected with um, a fire ant specific virus. So we wanted to see if um, um, we can 
uses idea and implies for honeybees and there um, and there are actually a couple of studies that have been able to show some evidence where um, new pollen nutrition and bee nutrition can actually help bees improve their tolerance to pesticide exposure. Um, in this case, this is uh, for dietary nicotine, which is within the same class as new nicotinoids. And um, uh, Michaela was a former student um, in the Rangel lab. And I, I don't remember what exact pesticides she used, but she found that the lipid fraction of the pollen can actually um, improve bee resilience to um, those pesticides that she tested on them too. So we actually did this experiment over the past couple of years or so on the foreign wing virus and Nosema serrani. And uh, I'm not going to go into this experiment in too much detail because um, Alex, um, this is in collaboration with Alex Payne, who is still currently um, a PhD student at Texas A&M University. She's actually defending her dissertation uh, in about a month and a half or two. Um, so she'll be talking about this work then. Um, if you don't follow Dr. Rangel's Facebook page already, um, you should um, follow that if you are interested in attending this talk and hearing about the study. But I'm just showing you some of the methods and what entailed, what was in, um, what the study entailed. But we had these experiments where we had the 30-20 diet that we found from that previous study I showed you, a high protein diet and a high lipid diet and also a no diet. And we tested these different diets with bees that were not infected with honeybees here or bees that were infected, I'm sorry, that were infected with the foreign wing virus, excuse me. And over here, we have bees that were infected with um, the foreign wing virus. Um, so we tested these diets and we want to see whether or not we can improve honeybee tolerance to um, the foreign wing virus um, stress. And also, we also did Nosema in a separate study. Um, and I mean, these are just some pictures here showing so, some of the work that we did at a &M. But if you want to um, hear about this, I highly recommend tuning into that dissertation defense. If not, Alex is actually a native to Spring, Texas. So I am sure that she would be ecstatic to present to y'all one of these days if you invite her in the future. But um, nowadays, um, I'm currently out in Mississippi with the USDA and I'm doing some similar work, but I'll, I'll still be um, working with bee nutrition, but relative to Southern crop ecosystems, because in these ecosystems, bees are constantly being exposed to um, pesticides because it's a very high ag system where I'm at. Um, I'm out in the Mississippi Delta where um, we have lots of soybeans and cotton and we're trying to find ways to improve honeybee tolerance to these pesticides. And I'm, I'm there to look at how nutrition can be used to that. So I'm going to continue this work and expand on some of the work that I showed in those two studies um, where um, bee nutrition can possibly be used in, to improve bee tolerance to pesticide exposure. And that's a picture of the um, current lab that I'm, um, I'm starting up. We just hired um, a lab technician to work there and we are um, trying to expand and get things going for this upcoming season, which is right around the corner. But for the work that I presented here, these are all the acknowledgements that I need to uh, give all the committee members on PI and the different funding sources that played a role in this project. So, um, sorry, she changed the email. Um, yeah, I'll update this. So yeah, I with that I can take questions. If um, you think of one later, you can also email me um, question later on too. Well, I'm taking a look at the chat now to see what I missed. All right, so I guess um, I'll just go down the chat and address some of these questions. So first one here is from Ron Collins. Are there supplements that approach the ideal um, that the bees naturally regulate in terms of protein, lipids, and carbohydrates? Um, so um, to, this is something that we are still actively working on. So uh, this work, that I just presented, it's still in the process of publication. 
Uh, so we are, um, we're, everything's done. We're, we're just in that publication process right now. So um, besides this presentation and other places I've presented this work at, um, a lot of this work is not even out yet. Um, so to directly answer this, I, I can't give you like a specific um, supplement that is best. Um, I, that's not what I studied. If you, um, and, and, and the data that I presented will not um, so, like, give you like a, an a, ideal diet because there's so much variation in terms of what's in them. It's not just proteins and lipids that we're looking at. Um, there are also so many different micronutrients and um, phenols and um, and different phytochemicals, for example, that one diet may have that another one does not. Fortunately, a lot of these diets are proprietary, and um, I don't. I mean, the information of what it's made up of is not available, so it's really hard for me to um, say one. But if you, the closest thing I can give you is to refer back to that graph or that chart that um, is in Dr. Jamie Ellis's study. Um, that's something that you can compare and make a decision on based on that data. Um, but if, as a beekeeper, if you have multiple colonies, if you do have, if you do have like a very strong colony that um, does collect extra pollen, you can trap them and move, make pollen pat patties and move them around different colonies that might need them more than others. Um, the next question from Nicole, how do we as urban beekeepers visually identify the pollen by the color and time of year on their corbicula? Is there a good guide for amateur paleontologists without a microscope? Yeah, so unfortunately, this is something that's incredibly difficult. Dr. Bryant um, himself, who is the world expert, who was a world expert, um, he took 20, he, he says it took him 20 years for him to even be remotely good at um, what he does. Um, I've worked with them for about six or six or seven years. Um, um, four of them were pretty heavy. I worked on them pretty heavily, but even then, um, I did, there are limitations to what I can identify as well. Um, and unfortunately, for in terms of using in terms of using um, doing physical morphological identification, um, it gets pretty technical because you have to process the pollen using very strong acids that you probably can't get a hold of um, outside of a lab setting. And it's also um, dangerous to process them because the acids are very reactive to um, water and exposure to them in a proper way and that will actually cause it to pop and explode in the fume hood. Um, so it's not really safe to do so. Um, there is a beekeeper out in the I don't, I don't remember his name exactly, but there is a beekeeper out in the Louisiana Beekeepers Association who uh, meticulously went and collected pollen from plants themselves. Um, they stained, he stained the pollen grains um, and imaged them on this, uh, under a microscope and created a book um, about that. And Louisiana is pretty close. So I don't recall off the top of my head what his name was, but he did. He, he does have a book with a bunch of different pollen grains that he, um, uh, basically a pollen atlas of that area where he um, collected and made. So um, if you are interested in doing something similar, um, I would maybe reach out to the LBA and um, ask about him. Okay, so Javier asked, what is the impact of pesticides on backyard beekeeping? Any advantages to the ever-changing hybrid plants? Um, less pollen. Okay, so I'll answer this first question first before getting to the second one. But in the study that we actually have that's currently in review and that will be out within the next couple months or so, we actually found that in urban um, areas, at least in Austin, um, the bees actually did not collect much, um, we're not exposed to much pesticides compared to the other region. So um, compared to Calif Northern California region that where the pollen was collected, um, there were, um, that region had more immunocloprid in some of the um, pollen samples there. But at least in Texas, a lot of the uh, pesticides detected were very, very low, negligible, and even below the level of detection of the machines that were being used. Um, so 
uh, as far as that specific area in Austin, I, I don't think there's too much to be concerned of. Um, but the reason why we did that was because, um, I mean, you can, people, anyone can buy herbicides or pesticides over the counter in like Home Depot or Walmart and spray in the backyard, for example, or the city might spray for mosquitoes. Um, I mean, it really varies, varies from uh, location to location situation, but for the most part, um, at least in Austin, Texas, we did not see um, any reason to be really concerned, at least for urban beekeepers. Any advantages to the ever changing hybrid plants, um, less pollen? Um, that's something that is not very well studied, um, but um, I mean, if the if those plants, I don't know if you have one for um, to list as an example, but I mean, if there are less pollen or uh, they it might not be as attractive, or um, maybe it might not even be a quantity quantity thing. Maybe the quality of the pollen might be lower. Who who knows? That's not something that um, has really been looked at. Um, extensively. Um, what would be a sensitive amount of bee properties, for example, and or pollen substitutes? Um, so in terms of, I, I'm guessing this is like how much you should um, feed. Um, it really depends on the time of year and the status of the colony. I'm not going to give you like an exact um, weight or amount um, to go with. Um, and as a matter of fact, I haven't done too much like specific testing on different brands of patties myself. Everything that I've worked on was very controlled so I can um, manipulate the protein lipid ratios. Um, but you want to be careful with just blindly feeding um, pollen substitutes or patties because um, you can get, cause small high beetle issues. If the bee is not healthy, the colonies are not healthy enough to take the whole thing, then um, small high beetles will get into them. Um, there are certainly certain times of the year where it can be beneficial. So right before the spring, um, when the main flow is about to happen, you want a very um, you want to have a population ready to go before that huge nectar flow comes in. So you have the foragers to collect that and bring that into your colony, so that you have the resources available to um, grow and maybe um, harvest honey if that's what you're interested in. Um, but yeah, it's a case by case scenario. If you see that your bees are active, you think that the um, winter season is ending and, and into your final cold snap, then um, it might be a good idea to feed some um, protein supplementation for them. Um, Becky asks, wouldn't it be healthier to work on using less pesticides and trying to increase the tolerance of bees to pesticides? Healthier for humans too. I mean, absolutely. Um, in a perfect world, if um, we 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 wouldn't be throwing chemicals into our environment, but um, it, it's something it, it's something that um, really be, it's a really touchy topic because um, we, we have a growing population, a global population that we can't even um, that is growing exponentially worldwide. Um, where, where are we at now? I don't even know, like eight, nine billion people uh, on the on Earth. But um, with that being said, um, in order to produce the amount of food required to feed a lot, um, the population, a like growing population, we um, monocultures of crops are needed, especially um, in order to uh, efficiently grow a lot of um, crops, such as soybeans, or even feed for cattle. Um, and, and then it, it, it's a, you really have to find a fine balance um, moving forward with this. There's not a right or wrong um, answer to this point. But yeah, in, in a perfect world, I mean, we wouldn't be throwing all the chemicals out of there in the environment. Um, yeah, Dr. Bryant was a great uh, mentor. And yeah, so that's one of the reasons. And yeah, we cannot control the pesticides we use by neighbors. That's one of the reasons why. Um, we um, did this study to see whether bees in urban environments um, are um, at a, um, can be exposed to high levels of pesticides. And in the specific areas that we looked at at that given time, it wasn't a current concern. Um, who knows, it might be nowadays. Um, we just have not continued the study and done it longitudinally. Um, are there any study between fatty acids and varroa and deforming virus? That's a great question. That's actually something that um, I am very interested in looking at. 
um, um, at least in my program. Uh, I'm kind of working on some collaborations to maybe look at some varroa nutrition as well too, because it was just that recent study by Samuel Ramsey that um, made that groundbreaking like study uh, findings that varroa actually feeds on the fat body of the honeybee instead of the hemolymph. So um, yeah, different bees at different life stages and different types of bees, drones or workers may have different nutrient compositions that the varroa is feeding on. Maybe like if they're feeding on something uh, like on, on a, one of the bees that has higher lipids and might have improved the tolerance to uh, miticides, for example, so who, who knows? That's something that um, I am interested in looking into and has not been done yet. Um, yeah, Home Depot sells hybrid sunflower. Yeah, um, there are so many varieties in sunflower. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't even have a count on how many different types of varieties of sunflower there are. Uh, but yeah, there's some sunflowers that are really good at producing oils, for example. Um, maybe this may be the Louisiana pollen document mentioned. Let's see. Oh, yeah, this is uh, one of the, the um, this paper that Wendy posted. Um, this is uh, Meredith Lowe, uh, and she, this was like studies that were done in the like, 1950s and 60s, but they looked at the pollen and honey, if I, um, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they looked at honey samples. So bees actually go to different resources to collect honey and um, other resources to collect their pollen samples. It really depends on um, what they're going after. But yeah, this is a good resource to look at. Um, the, the person who created the book for um, Louisiana Pollen, um, he's, he, I mean, this was just a couple of years ago that I, I saw him at, or maybe like three, four years ago, I saw him at an LBA meeting. Um, so he, he's probably still around. And if you reach out to them, they might be able to point you to the right direction. Are there any other questions? All right. Yeah. I think we're good. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah. Let's see. So let's see if you stop sharing your screen, I'll start sharing mine. Um, I don't have, oh, there it is. Okay. There you go. And back to, there we go. All right. So we did the questions already. And now it is to, Pierre, that was a great talk. I'm glad we recorded it because I'm gonna have to go back and watch it three or four more times to figure out everything what you said, but. Yeah, yeah, and I, I try to keep the, I mean, so the science in there and try to try my best to explain it because I, I do think, um, I, I don't wanna just give like a statement without the supporting data and not back it up, um, so. I really, I mean, I hope that it went through and, uh, and things made sense with the geometric framework and all that. And if not, you can refer to the summary points um, at the end of each, each section. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. All right, so Mike, uh, we're gonna turn over to Mike, our vice president and the um, magic random number generator for the door prizes. All right, hey, uh, thanks again, Pierre, for coming. That was, that was a really good talk. I was very, uh, learned a lot already. I'll learn more in the second time I'll watch it. <laughs> um, so for the door prizes this, this week, I got two of them. They're, uh, they're gift certificates to uh, Miller Bee Supply. I heard they have really good woodenware. So if you use this on woodenware, you have to let me know if it, how, how it turns out. Um, so the winners are James Burrow and Kelsey White Bay. Um, if y'all want to I guess what's the best way to do this? Just if you can just direct message me your uh, address, I'll get them in the mail tomorrow. All right, fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today to join in and listen to Dr. Loud's speech. And um, our next meeting is going to be the 15th of February, and we will be back at Bayland Community Center. So, um, we have that reserved for the rest of the year. So we'll be there uh, the Tuesday, February 15th. Hope to see you all then.
Thank you. Bye.